Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to um, talk at the um, conference. Um, my presentation this afternoon is going to look at um, responsible tin sourcing in the context of the ITA and its members. Um, as a matter of introduction, my name is Stephen Tyro. I'm a supply chain standards manager with the International Tin Association. Um, so my um, presentation is split in, into five sections. So the first section will uh, give an overview of the ITA, the International Tin Association. The second one will look at what the ITA does. And then the third section will look at the three tools we've developed um, to promote and drive responsible tin sourcing within the supply chain. And then um, the fourth section would try to pull together the three different tools and how they interact with um, the different actors within the supply chain. And then um, finally, I'd like to conclude with some food for thought or some ideas on what the perceived future of um, responsible tin sourcing is. So the International Tin Association it, uh, accounts for 75% of global tin production um, through its members located in 10 countries across four continents. Um, the association has four core goals. The first is to provide leadership by working with stakeholders to determine strategic direction and priorities in the tin industry. Secondly, take responsibility in the sector by implementing projects to resolve issues impacting tin supply and its players. Thirdly, to manage, coordinate the expectations of um, stakeholders such as tin users, regulators, NGOs, and wider interested parties. And then the fourth one is to simplify the burden of reporting through integrated cross-recognized tools, benchmarked to relevant standards. And um, one of the core tools we've developed to actually address this issue is the ITA Code of Conduct. So moving on to the tools. The first tool I'm going to look at is the ISKI program, which is an upstream due diligence tool aimed at addressing conflict financing human rights abuses, and other risks, such as bribery in the mineral supply chain. It's a joint industry initiative of gov governmental authorities, companies, and civil society and civil organizations. ISKI is implemented in four supply countries, and these four countries are the DRC, Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda. And its operational area covers over 88 million hectares, which is roughly about three times the surface area of the UK. The program provides company and on the ground monitoring annually for 115,000 tons of um, 3T concentrates. So that's tin, tungsten, and tantalum, and has a social impact, um, which would link back to um, the SDGs, which was mentioned in a previous talk, um, by having an impact on the lives of 70,000 miners and um, workers in related services to the sector and their dependents. So um, the next tool, which is the second um, IT tool, is the due diligence assessment criteria. So um, the due diligence, due diligence assessment criteria was developed through a joint partnership between the ITA and Responsible Minerals Initiative, the RMI. So, both of these organizations share a common objective to encourage and promote responsible production, trade, and sourcing within the tin 
value chain, the ITA concentrates on um, the upstream aspects and um, the RMI um, has an active foothold within the downstream aspect uh, side of the supply chain. The joint partnership with the RMI was to ensure an outcome of an assessment tool that reflected the common upstream, downstream understanding and interpretation of the OECD due diligence guidance. It also um, was um, developed so it um, translated the um, OECD guidance into auditable, um, concise, clear language to uh, prevent um, misunderstanding between auditors and auditees. And it is um, developed so it's recognized and aligned with the OECD um, requirements subject to official assessment by the OECD as we're currently looking at uh, working with the OECD to get it assessed and recognized. Um, it's also um, developed so it recognizes and supports participants in conforming with regulatory requirements. Another requirement such as Dodd-Frank, the EU mineral regulations, and the LME responsible sourcing requirements. Um, the tool could either be um, assured via the RMI approach, which is an ISO approach, or the ITA approach, which is an ISA 3000 um, approach. And then the third and final uh, tool is the um, ITA code of conduct. So the ITA code of conduct um, came about as a result of um, the multiple requirements um, I, um, ITA members, so that's tin producers and smelters, were facing from requests for multiple um, information to demonstrate their um, responsible performance across the supply chain. And what tended to happen was generally um, requests came in different formats and um, often looked at different um, sectors of um, the ESG requirements. So sometimes the questionnaire was more um, environmental uh, focus or it could have been more social or governance focused. So um, the ITA decided to come up with a tool that actually pulled together all three um, requirements, all three ESG requirements within a single integrated report. The report um, consists of 10 principles which are sub, um, supported by 70 standards. And again, all these standards um, would help participants demonstrate um, how they meet the different um, requirements of the 17 SDG um, goals. Um, the mode of um, measuring um, conformance is progressive. So it's not an outright pass or fail. And the benefit of this is due to the phased ranking, it's adaptable and it's uh, to the scale of the biz business, its scope or mat maturity. So what you find is regardless of the size of the business, it's able to engage with um, the tool to report its performance and how it's, uh, what it's doing. It also encourages um, continuous improvement because as it's not an outright pass or fail approach, companies are able to engage with it at whatever point they find themselves in terms of maturity. So my next slide, what I've tried to do is um, illustrate um, the different um, tools, the different um, IT tools. So that's the code, um, the ISKI um, due diligence program and um, the due diligence assessment criteria. And try and show uh, the interrelation between the different tools and um, the different um, sections of the um, supply chain. The red arrows illustrate what the tool specifies and which actors could promote and support its use by specifying them in contracts. The gray arrows illustrate the coverage of the IT code with um, sections in the broken line, um, highlighting where 
we still have some work to do in terms of gaining buying and engagement. So generally that tends to be more with um, mineral traders as um, we have a lot of work to do as in we currently have not been able to get the engagement or the interest to get them to push um, responsible sourcing. It tends to be more uh, driven downstream and upstream with a, that gap in um, traders. And whilst um, they, uh, and then finally the green, different shades of green reflect um, the um, ISKI and the um, due diligence assessment criteria requirements. So to um, finish up my presentation, um, I just wanted to um, try to summarize what I believe and feel um, will be important points for the future of responsible tin sourcing going forward and look into the future. So for the foreseeable future, there's definitely going to be a need to address and respond to new legislative requirements for um, responsible trade until we reach such a point that um, governments and um, stakeholders are confident that um, the sector is doing what it needs to do and there's no need for further um, legislation. Um, tin producers will also have to continue to respond to requirements from downstream because downstream um, companies have to meet the requirements of their users and other um, organizations such as the LME, which is the London Metal Exchange, who um, I think spoke earlier this week about their responsible sourcing um, tool, which is soon to come into force. Secondly, uh, based on the work of the um, ISKI program in the DRC, um, it's, there's cause to believe that um, from the experience in the DRC, um, the DRC should be in a position to um, continue producing safe and responsible um, tin. And then lastly, um, the ITA Code of Conduct uh, will, should um, provide transparent information which will mitigate risks as it's an integrated report and which measures um, companies on their performance across um, ESG, so that's the environment and social um, requirements. And finally, um, I think a combination of all these points um, together will um, drive um, progressive improvement and better sustainability within the su tin supply chain. Uh, my final slide um, is uh, a list of um, supply chain actors and um, players we work with to ensure cross recognition of the different standards which uh, we have within the sector and the um, tools out there to ensure uh, responsible sourcing. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Stephen. And as always, you can imagine that wonderful applause that is coming <laughs> at you from behind those microphones. Brilliant. Um, so just to pick up on some of the chatter that's going on, and ladies and gentlemen, you'll now be glad to know that we also have um, various people WhatsApping us um, with questions as well. So this is fabulous. The number of windows open on my screen and Rosa's screen is growing. Um, but Stephen, just to pick up on, on one of the points you made, and perhaps especially with regards to your um, some of your fantastic initiatives, and that was around where is the blocker in terms of getting this to work? And you mentioned the mineral traders not really wanting to engage with responsible sourcing. Um, do you want to expand on that slightly so we can understand it a bit better? Okay. So um, generally, um and this is based on my experience, um, traders tend to be more uh, driven by oil, um, sorry, mineral prices. So it's what the price is today and what it's gonna to be tomorrow and uh, with less of a long-term focus. Um, whereas um, with, ideally, if they actually thought it through, um, the long-term sustainability of a mineral would um, determine its long-time viability and price. Um, but again, I think it's something to do with the field, uh, with the sector. Um, traders tend to uh, not to be offensive, tend to burn out early because it's a high stress uh, sector. So 
So it's about coming in into the sector and um, working, making your mark, making what as much money as you can within a given time frame. And so there's a less of a, of a um, long-term focus and hence the reason why um, generally I think there's a lack of uh, forward thinking of the need for um, sustainability to drive um, prices because if you actually looked at, um, uh, if they actually take time to look at the Im impact of sustainability on minerals and the price, um, it could actually work to their favor. Just to add to that, um, downstream companies as well, whilst they um, do a lot of, uh, uh, while this, there's a lot of requirement um, placed on the upstream sector, um, not many of the downstream companies tend to um, actually ask for the information or push uh, for the uh, specified information within their contracts or request information to actually support um, the responsible tools, uh, sourcing tools and drive them and promote initiatives out there to um, drive um, responsible sourcing. So is this a case here where you're asking for those customers downstream of those traders to actually include in those contracts stipulations or specifications saying we need to know exactly what the proven provenance is of this tin, for example? Is that what you're requesting? Absolutely. So that's what we're doing. And um, what we're doing is we're wor we also work with um, other partners in other metals, so like Responsible Steel, the LME. Um, the OECD to kind of like ensure our standards are uh, cross recognize each other, cross reference, reference each other, and um, and then it also makes it easier for um, downstream companies to push them and promote them because I think if fair could be well, if this um, tool is limited and it doesn't have a wide um, coverage, and then um, there might be limitations to wanting to push it or. Uh, progress it or encourage it. So through collaboration across the supply chains, through metal associations and partners, uh, we're hoping um, this should improve over time. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much for that. So um, Stephen, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear and anybody else who's, who's interested in this, um, the session that we held earlier on today um, included a number of talks which link really nicely into this, including Grant Erskine, who talked uh, from True Sourcing. So that was a case there of saying, how can we actually fingerprint where some of that metal, for example, has actually come from along that value chain? Um, and, and he was actually followed up by uh, Louis Marshall from the OECD, so we could actually see that framework coming into play. Um, so the final question for you just now, Stephen, is, um, so you spoke to us about tin and then, of course, going sideways slightly into some of those other teas, so the, the tungsten and the tantalum, for example. Um, are there any other commodities that perhaps we can draw from, from a case study perspective, where people have managed to get that responsible sourcing to work in a perhaps a more connected manner? Um, yes. Uh, so, um, as I said earlier, um, we... Across the metal organizations, um, there's a lot of um, work going on in the background, um, in collaborative work in the background. So we have steel currently working on a standard, um, and a steel consists of uh, the raw materials going into steel come from different uh, metal sources. Um, so they're working with um, metal associations from core, 30 core critical um, raw materials. So that's um, copper, zinc, um, tin, to mention a few, um, to actually drive and develop a standard that um, promotes and works towards um, um, the greater sustainability of um, metals as a whole. Brilliant, thank you. And a final question, because it's just snuck in here from Sandra. And Sandra asks you, um, well, she says that last week she read an article about the use of blockchain in the metal supply chain. Um, is that something you've been looking at? Would it help, et cetera? Um, yes, uh, so um, the ISKI program, which I mentioned, which is based in the, the RC, is um, a um, traceability um, program. And I know I, I really can't talk about the ISKI program because I don't lead on it, but I know this is something they've considered. 
But I think one of the challenges for now is um, like when you look at um, um, regions like the DRC, where um, it's rural, it's, um, it's the minerals and rural area, um, it's um, limited um, in terms of um, connectivity, internet access. Um, these are potential challenges to blockchain because blockchain is uh, dependent on um, technology being available and readily functional. So um, until such a time, uh, we're able to address these challenges. Um, and you know, these are ongoing things. And I think it, downstream companies who also are in technology also are looking into this. But definitely, um, the, it's, uh, blockchain is an area which is being looked into. It's not been ruled out. And it's uh, potentially a good way forward. Brilliant. So with that, thank you very much, Stephen. Another round of applause from behind our virtual, well, behind our real microphones. Um, thank you very, very much.